and we are live once again. Happy Thursday, happy Friday, whatever day it happens to be for you. This is Caleb Beer's second stream for today, in which we discuss Thus Spake Zarathustra, Chapter 35, The Sublime Ones. Mr. Beers, what kind of an introduction would you like to give? Well... The Sublime Ones is going to be a bad solution to the problem enumerated in the last live stream. And Nietzsche is talking about it here. And he's going to talk about the Sublime Ones. And correct me if I'm wrong, Matt, but these are the ones who choose the Hermit solution, correct? Well, he talks about these, yes. But he also, he doesn't leave them with that. He, he does actually state should he become weary of his sublimeness the sublime one then only will his beauty begin and then only will i taste him and find him savory so there is still hope there is still hope and nietzsche clings on to that hope calm is the bottom of the sea who would guess that it hideth droll monsters now i know what droll means in the modern sense is it in archaic sense, where he's using droll here. What would you say? Uh, you mean archaic as in the sense that it's kind of silly, almost? Yes. Yes, I would say that it would be the archaic Who sense. See. Who would guess Droll that monsters. Unmoved is my depth, but it sparkleth with swimming enigmas and laughters. So his depth is unmoved. It's ineffable to him. It's the depths of his being. Uh, you know, he, he's saying that his virtue is ineffable to him as he thinks it should be to everyone. Everyone's virtue should, should have their own ineffable virtue. But even though it's unmoved, there are swimming enigmas and laughters. It sort of sparkle. It's sort of this dance of a silent joy. A sublime one saw I today, a solemn one, a penitent of the spirit. Oh, how my soul laughed at his ugliness. With upraised breast and like those who draw in their breath, thus did he stand the sublime one in silence. So this a uh, pompous, ridiculous person. Or hung with ugly truths the spoil of his hunting, and rich in torn raiment, many thorns also hung on him, but I saw no rose. So the spoil of his hunting, basically... Uh, I'm hearkening back to something that Schopenhauer said here, actually, that an ill temperament consists in a tendency to seek out things that vex and annoy you and then brood over them. Like you go looking for things that are going to piss you off and depress you and annoy you and vex you and so on. And you go hunting after them and then you brood over them. That's what this guy's doing because he has bad temper. Many thorns hang on him, but no rose. Every rose has its thorn, to quote a completely different sort of source, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> some thorns have no rose, like this dude. Not yet had he learned laughing and beauty. Gloomy did this hunter return from the forest of knowledge. Okay, so we have the forest of knowledge. We have the forest of knowledge. So, it's not like he's completely in the wrong place. But as Caleb was clearly stating, he's searching after the wrong thing and then doing the wrong thing with the knowledge that he gains. Brooding is a bad thing to be doing. We discussed at the end of our previous stream, which you can uh, find it will be at once everything is done processing, everything will be added to the Zarathustra playlist on Caleb's channel. And our previous stream was about uh, chapter 28. Uh, on the end of our previous stream, we talked about all the different things that we should be focused upon. And there are many things that are true that are also not lovely or beautiful. There are many things that are true that will cause us pain and drag us down. And yes, of course, we have to deal with them, but if we brood on them and we don't see the picture in its entirety, 
you know the, the 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 beauty amongst some of the evil things the 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 roses amongst the thorns will be missing out on a lot of life will be miserable human beings we will be largely unwilling to do anything good because we've been filling ourselves up with only bad so when you're going into the forest of knowledge, be careful what it is you're filling yourself with. Stream you can be up on the out. stream is dropping out. Yes, just warning you, it's doing the circle thing and it's buffering. Well, that's interesting. It says here zero dropped frames, so I'm wondering if that's maybe it's my phone. Let me try it again. Oh, yep, there it goes. False alarm. Excuse me. Okay. So this whole gloomy did this hunter return from the forest of knowledge is 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 an important point to make because the forest of knowledge isn't of it in and of itself bad. <clears throat> we just need to be very discerning what we return with. Right. And what you're saying is in the force of – again, this is um, this is hearkening back to what he says. One should be careful when one fights with monsters lest one become a monster. And when you gaze into an abyss, the abyss gazes also into you. From the fight with wild beasts returned he home. But even yet a wild beast gazeth out of his seriousness, an unconquered wild beast. And when he says his seriousness, first of all, well, first of all, he's become a wild beast from fighting with wild beasts, is what Nietzsche is saying. Second of all, Nietzsche doesn't mind that this guy is serious. He just, he has a problem with the fact that he never laughs. Nietzsche thinks you can be cheerful and serious at once, and you can. But his problem with this guy is he, he's not cheerful. He's got the serious part. He's got that right. This guy isn't totally in the wrong. There's a reason for why he is this way. He's just got to learn how to laugh. He's got to find the bright side of things, silver lining, rainbow after long storms, etc. As a tiger doth he ever stand on the point of springing, but I do not like those strained souls. Ungracious is my taste towards all those self-engrossed ones. And why are they self-engrossed? And I can speak to this much as I'll be able to speak on the chapter on immaculate perception, which we'll do later uh, in a different stream. When he says that this guy is self-engrossed, here's what he means. When somebody spends all their time being serious because they've been to the forest of knowledge, you know, they've spent time in reflection and sort of caught some of this stuff and figured it out, what is going on is that they are afraid. So they're constantly thinking through all the bad possibilities to try and stop it because they're pessimistic. But their fear causes them to withdraw and think about all this stuff, so they're self-engrossed ones. They haven't learned to laugh. If he had learned to laugh, he wouldn't be afraid, and if he'd stop being afraid, he'd learn to laugh. He's afraid because he can't laugh, and he can't laugh because he's afraid. Well, here we are. I'm, I'm actually I, – I went to find uh, the Chronicles of Narnia, um, and there's like the, the um, C.S. Lewis depiction of heaven in the final book. And uh, there were a group of people that were laughing. They had they they were exposed to the the wonder of 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 heaven, the wonder of constantly seeing things anew, of constantly seeing things getting really really you know bright, going further up, and so on. So 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 people went up to the high places, and they were initially just just so struck that they thought it was amazing. However, C.S. Lewis brings up the point and says. It was so exactly like the sort of thing they had heard him say long ago in that other world where his beard was gray instead of golden. He knew why they were laughing and joined in the laugh himself, but very quickly they all became grave again. For, as you know, there is a kind of happiness and wonder that makes you serious. It is too good to waste on jokes. And what Nietzsche is saying here is this guy is the wrong kind of serious. Mm -hmm. not, not the like, happy kind of serious. Happy. Huh? Not the happy kind of serious. Right. 
he's not so happy you can't waste it on a joke. He hasn't even learned to make the joke yet. Learn how to joke and then do the hat so happy you can't joke thing. Mm-hmm. And tell me, friends, that there is to be no dispute about taste and tasting, but all life is a dispute about taste and tasting. And he's saying that this guy has no taste, mostly because he shovels shit down his throat to, to uh, make himself immune to it. Don't do that. You, there'll be enough shit without you seeking it out so you can eat it. Taste. That is weight at the same time, and scales and wear. And alas, for every living thing that would live without dispute about weight and scales and wear. Taste is weight. It is, it is the thing being assessed. It is the person assessing it. It is that by which these things are assessed. You are what you assess, and you are the way you assess it. The thing you assess is you, and the thing you assess is the way it is assessed. The way you assess you are the way uh, the way you assess things is the way you are, and the way you assess things is what they are. Should he become weary of his sublimeness, this sublime one, then only will his beauty begin. And then only will I taste him and find him savory. And only when he turneth away from himself will he o'erleap his own shadow, and verily, into his son. So yeah, this guy's got to pull his, dig his head out of his ass and stop being so inward turning out of fear. And as soon as he does, he'll get that thing he wants that really does belong to him. He'll, he'll finally get it as soon as he... And, and, and to be a little bit more kind to him, perhaps, not just dig his head out of his ass, but also uh, maybe think it's worth it to leap. Maybe think that uh, there, he does have a son he can leap to. That's part of it, too. Because far too long did he sit in the shade. The cheeks of the penitent of the spirit became pale. He almost starved on his expectations. Contempt is still in his eye, and loathing hid, hideth in his mouth. To be sure, he now resteth but he hath not yet taken rest in the sunshine okay so 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 he has he he's gotten to the point that we discussed in chapter 28 where there is the loathing and the loathing has pushed him but he hasn't gone through the bitterness he hasn't drank the entire cup of bitterness to find the morsel on the bottom that makes it worth it and he's not going to do that until he becomes weary of his sublimeness. Until he stops the 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 pity party. Until he stops the this The, the, the loathing can only be the impetus. The loathing can only be the impetus. And if it remains while you're still seeking, well, you need to go back into the forest of knowledge and hunt f- and, and, and hunt for better stuff. You need to keep on going. You need to keep on going through the pain, through the bitterness, through the trouble, through all the other nasty stuff that you find. Because the world is a very dark and dangerous and nasty place. And find the morsels that make it worth it. He has to kill that unconquered wild beast, and that's going all the way through it. But he has to make the leap to kill it, and he has to kill it to make the leap. That's the staring into the abyss, and the abyss stares into you. It's a staring contest with your own abyss, and either it sees through you and swallows you, or you see through it and dispel it. Exactly. Uh, and, and, And is that contending with the beasts can very well turn you into a beast. Contending with the beast can can and, and 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 likely will turn you into a beast at least at some point. It's that mastery of that 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 beast. Like you don't you don't lose it either. Hair on your chest. Yeah, you don't lose it. You don't lose being the lion. It's in taming the lion that you can become a child and see the world with new eyes. 
that hearkening back to the th or, or we're referring here back to the three metamorphoses the camel the load-bearing spirit that takes all this heavy stuff and goes into its solitude and becomes a lion that is strong enough to create room for itself so that it can become a child and create new things so the camel takes all this heavy stuff goes back into solitude and processes it itself like a self-rolling wheel separate from everything else gains its identity that makes it a lion and makes it strong and the power of the lion can clear out all this other nonsense and all this load bearing heavy stuff and clear a space and then the child can make something new but 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 if you're if you're still just this whining you know just just a mangy little pup you know you know you know just 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 a mangy little lion kiddo that doesn't do anything like let's let let let's say if you're or, or or a whiny little adolescent like Simba, as opposed to growing and 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 actually grabbing life by the balls like you're supposed to, uh, you're you, you there's still more contending to be done, and because it's part of the process, Nietzsche, yeah, he doesn't really like it, and he's like, yeah, get over yourself, move, 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 kick in the ass, kick in the ass, but. I don't think that he views it as being any sort of a a problem. It's just a natural part in the order of things. It's a natural way that the progression through this thing develops. But you can't stay at being the sublime one, this half camel, half lion, partially partially having gone through metamorphosis, but partially just staying an embittered <coughs> an, an embittered creature laden with the with, with the cares of the world but still who doesn't have the strength to deal with it all you know that that metamorphosis takes time Contempt is still in his eye, and loathing hideth in his mouth. To be sure, he now resteth, but he hath not yet taken rest in the sunshine. As the ox ought he to do, and his happiness should smell of the earth, and not of contempt for the earth. So what does the ox do? Well, the ox is a beast of burden. Right, so we're talking about a camel carrying a burden. What does an ox do? You put a yoke on an ox, and sometimes you'll put a yoke on two oxen, and they will pull a plow. They will do something useful. They won't just sit there under a load. They will move forward under a load. They will plod, and they will wind up smelling like sweat and like the, the, the ground that they are, are tilling. Right? It's not like the life of an ox is easier, but it's certainly preferable to carrying around a, a burden that winds up being too much, and it's certainly preferable to not being able to deal with things. I mean, struggle with it. Be willing to struggle, but be willing to struggle systematically. I mean, oxen don't just go and pull a plow in no direction. An oxen pull a plow straight in a straight line, and then they turn around and pull it in another straight line, and then turn around and pull it in another straight line. They just proceed in an orderly fashion through the process of tilling the soil. So, as the ox ought he to do, and his happiness should smell of the earth, and not of contempt for the earth. So, if we're, if we're viewing things, I mean, the earth that it's tilling is, as we discussed, and it kind of fits from, a sim or is a similar, in a metaphorical sense, to chapter 28, there's crap. There's animal crap all over there. It serves to fertilize what you're going to be planting, right? But you're still going to have to deal with the crap, but you don't have to necessarily treat the crap with so much contempt. I mean, it is contemptuous, certainly, but if that's the end-all and the be-all of it, well, then you miss out on a lot of the potential, the potential for growth, the potential that it winds up being a medium for something greater. So, as a white ox, would I like to see him, which snorting, 
and lowing, walketh before the plowshare, and his lowing should also laud all that is earthly. Dark is still his countenance, the shadow of his hand danceth upon it, o'ershadowed is still the sense of his eye. His deed itself is still the shadow upon him, his doing obscureth the doer. Not yet hath he overcome his deed. To be sure, I love in him the shoulders of the ox, but now do I want to see also the eye of the angel, or the eye of the lion. <coughs> These are... A copy of the fake Zarathustra. What? I just put the book down somewhere. I'm looking for it. Excuse me, guys. Oh, there it is. Look right. So. There it is. So... So, so, so the whole point is to struggle with this, and the whole and 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 the whole point is to see what you're doing with a new eye. The angel, if we look at the, at uh, what what angels do, especially in the Western tradition, angels are bearers of news. Certainly, they are powerful beings, and they can uh, be uh, uh, fighting wars. But generally, their function is to bear news. So speaking life into whatever situation you happen to be would be the function of an angel. And so if you wind up having the eye of the angel, you'll have the eye for something with hope, something with promise, something into which you can speak life. Also, his hero will hath he still to unlearn. I'm going to hook up with what you said in just a second, but I want to get oh, these next ones out. An, exal an exalted one shall he be, and not only a sublime one. The ether itself should raise him, the will-less one. He hath subdued monsters, he hath solved enigmas, but he should also redeem his monsters and enigmas. Into heavenly children should he transform them. So what he's saying here is that the load-bearing spirit returns in the lion, or there is a spirit in the lion that is load-bearing, but it's different. It's not like the camel that just carries around crap that other people have piled on it and just takes the heaviest things it can find. The ox is doing this deliberately, like Matt said, in a straight line. It's doing this to cultivate something. And he says, but he should also redeem his monsters and enigmas that he is subdued and solved. Kind of like when he says, if you are possessed of a devil, rear up thy devil, there is still a path to greatness open for you. So what he's saying is, is this guy, the penitent in spirit, is throwing a pity party. He's weighed down with all this stuff. Uh, you know, he, he's kind of self-flagellating too, perhaps a little bit too much on that side as well. Um, and to his credit, done a, he's done a lot of work already. He's killed some monsters and solved some enigmas, but that was all violent work. That was all destructive. This guy's got to learn husbandry. He's got to learn to go in a straight line with this stuff. Matt? Oh, I thought you wanted to speak because you moved your mic. No, I just found out uh, how that there was this mute button in OBS. How long have we been silent? Oh, 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 so that's why you're... We haven't been. I, I was just muting my mic because I'm sick and tired of trying to remember to move my mic back. It's easier for me to remember to push a button. Gotcha. So anyway, this guy, this person, he has a... You know, the guy's weighed down with all this shit, and his the violent strength that he had is not enough. As a tiger doth he ever stand on the point of springing, but I do not like those strange souls. Because to date, this guy realized he had a bunch of shit to deal with after he was a camel, and then he turned into a lion, and he, he conquered it through sort of sheer willpower. You know, this guy has already conquered a lot of these problems, he, but it's all been violent, it's all been destructive, it's all been deconstructing, it's all been burning away, clearing out the bullshit, and the guy's just sort of swept everything clean at this point. And the problem he's got is that he needs to have some of the ox in him, the shoulders of an ox, 
the eye of an angel to perfect or to affect to effect the transition from a lion into a child i i mean do what do you think matt do you think he's in the lion stage right now this guy or is he still in the camel stage well it's a metamorphosis right Mm -hmm. so the ox is the transitioning point the, the the so 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 if we understand it as beginning with camel and ending with lion all right lion lion and kind of angelic would be synonymous with each other well this intermediate mm -hmm. phase right here this intermediate phase is the phase of the ox hmm Nietzsche is characterizing one death. particular metamorphosis, me, metamorphosis that needs to take place, and that 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 is the metamorphosis of of knowing what to do with your burden. It's not that just you somehow magically turn into a lion. You have to know what to do with the burden that you have as a camel, and the answer to that question is very simple. You turn it into something that tills the soil and when the soil is tilled you can look at it with new eyes the eyes of somebody that's actually going to go and do something productive with it and it's interesting because that 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 lion stage is 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 pretty short lived because the actual producing is done by the person who sees the world with the eyes of the child and actually goes and and grows with whatever it is that he's doing but the but but the lion stage is necessary in order to, or I, and it's not a perfect it's not a perfect an analogy because we're dealing with angels and lions, right? But 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 you need to be able to you need to be able to deal with the situation as yet has no growth, and since a child hasn't seen anything yet, well, clearly the child won't be able to cause anything to happen. The child is powerless, but the child will be able to, once things have started to grow and once things have started to, 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 to be good, the child will be able to have an appreciation for them. And even if he returns to having things being very, very similar to what they were before, you know, kind of like an adventure of returning home or what have you, he'll be able to see home with a new set of eyes. He'll be able to, through the process of having struggled with it and having made something for himself and done something for himself, be able to see the world through fresh eyes. So right now we're just dealing with that transition point. Right now we're just dealing with the burden of the camel and what it what dealing with that looks like. The burden of the camel and what dealing with it looks like. Mm -hmm. How the transformation into a lion happens. <laughs> yes. As yet hath his knowledge not learned to smile, and to be without jealousy. As yet hath his gushing passion not become calm in beauty. Verily, not in satiety shall his longing cease and disappear, but in beauty. Gracefulness belongeth to the munificence of the magnanimous. So what we have here, let's see here. What we have here is, um, it's not that he'll have had his fill, right? It's not that he will have eaten enough that he's satiated. No, it's it's it, it, it's a vessel that's constantly being poured into one end and pouring out the other. But when it's when the pouring out is done right, that's when he no longer longs for something. Well, yeah, it's 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 you are you you are you are filled to overflowing. You're in in Ichi and and in a, in a in 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 the sense of of of, of or in, in a loose sense of understanding it in terms of Christian charity. This idea that you are so full of abundance yourself that you are capable of letting that abundance overflow onto others. That and that being understood as the healthy form of giving, yes, uh, because being completely satisfied just means okay, I am full. Okay, I'm not full overflowing, but I am full. Uh, and if I were to dump myself empty because I'm not still under a spigot, I'm still not constantly being replenished. I'm eventually going to pour myself out and be dry again. 
So it has to do with, or it's or Nietzsche is relating this to very much to a state of being. Of of this constant replenishment, and letting that replenishment and 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 taking in of good things and probably pondering good things and and so on being the being the fuel that drives you in 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 charity in love in 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 giving of yourself in creation. And interestingly, if we go and we view the thing in the in the context of the whole Ubermatch thing, um, <clears throat> the act of creating is a very godlike attribute. It's a very godlike attribute. And in, if we look in the Christian tradition, it's well, the the idea is that we are made in the image of God, and so we are certainly capable of godlike things. The the uh, creating something. Uh, from 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 parts more simple, and Nietzsche would of course just throw out the whole uh, God thing entirely and say, well, basically we are to transcend ourselves and 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 do this whole creating thing. But regardless, the whole point is, in the end, to to have input and output. You know, the artist sees the muse, the artist makes the art. Etc. Would you like for me to? No, I'm. I, I was about to respond. Okay. So, it's the creating part that this guy is missing. Basically, what the guy is missing is that it's all everything's been going in. Nothing has come out. Well, not every, not even everything, because he hasn't seen things with the eye of the angel. He hasn't gotten that spark. He hasn't seen the potential. He hasn't even gotten to the point of being able to see something. And if you don't see something, you can't create it. If you don't have something that you're aiming for, you're just going to be walking forward in the dark. Well, the eye of the angel is the eye of a creator. Yes, but you can't even... You, the, 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 the creation doesn't begin until after you've seen things. And if you're selectively looking only for the bad stuff, you're not going to see the stuff that you can actually have an impact on right now. And so it is your own lack of vision that gets in your way of being effective. It's your own lack of desire, sometimes even, to do something. If it's more comfortable for you to sit and stew in how miserable things are than it is for you to go and say, hey, there's actually something uh, good or true or beautiful that I can go and make out of this mess here. It might be a lot of work and it might be, you know, just going back and forth with the plow and scattering seed that may or may not grow but 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 you know there's a potential for something to come out of it until you wind up doing that the the whole rest of the 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 whole rest of the playing field is off limits for you to stand but precisely to the hero beauty is the hardest thing of them all unattainable is beauty by all ardent will a little more, a little less. Precisely this much here, it is the most here. To stand with relaxed muscles and with unharnessed will, that is the hardest for all of you, ye sublime ones. And what does that mean? With relaxed muscles and unharnessed will. Well, I'd say that has the to do The hardest thing is to let go? I think that has to do with being able to see things for what they are. Rather than with because remember, what, what, what drove them to this place? Loathing. Okay, so, right. so, 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 unharnessed will, I mean, you, you, you can't have that they, brooding. You, you can't be brooding over all this bad stuff. You can't be letting that fester. cart of loathing until the straps broke. And there's no cart there, but they're still straining as if it's there. And what Nietzsche wants them to do is realize the cart's not there. Those carts the, not that there. Thing that gave there the is rope, a plow. There is a plow, yes. But the cart isn't there. So stop straining against the cart and trying to get away from it. It's a plow now. Or the cart turned into a plow, perhaps. 
So well, go or, ahead and pull or you out. just or you decided to leave the cart behind and pick up the plow instead. Or perhaps even more along the lines of the metaphor, you took the parts of the cart, burnt away a whole bunch of the stuff that didn't need to be there, took the metal parts, melted it down and made the plowshare out of it, and attached yourself back to the plow and did something did something with the, the whole load that you were taking all, along the on, 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 on your merry ride. When power becometh gracious and descendeth into the visible, I call such condescension beauty. So the sublime one has built up all this power or has built up this enormous strength of spirit from bearing this load, but it needs to come out of here and get out there. And that's the hardest thing for the sublime one. Exactly, and that's why I keep on belaboring this point that, that he says at the, at, toward the beginning. Should he become weary of his sublimeness, this sublime one, then only will his beauty begin, and then only will I taste him and find him savory. And perhaps he becomes weary of his sublimeness when he feels a thirst for something in the earth. Perhaps that's what makes him weary of the sublime is actually desire of a different kind for whatever that might be. Money, women, power, who knows? But he's got to want something before he can get up and move. And that's also what the eye of the angel does, is it shows you a desire, something you want. And if you want it bad enough, you'll do all this. You can't just sit there and want it, obviously, but if you're just sitting there wanting it, I don't believe that you want it very badly. So when power becometh gracious and descendeth into the visible, I call such condescension beauty. And from no one do I want beauty so much as from thee, thou powerful one. Let thy goodness be thy last self-conquest. All evil do I accredit to thee, therefore do I desire of thee the good. Verily have I often laughed at the weaklings who think themselves good because they have crippled Pauls. People who fetishize victimhood, chapter 29, my favorite chapter, tarantulas, etc., but also people who think they're good because they can't do anything wrong because they can't do anything simpliciter. And from no one do I want beauty so much as from thee, thou powerful one. Let thy goodness be thy last self-conquest. All evil do I accredit to thee. What does that mean, that I do I accredit to thee? Like Well, I mean, if you're if if you are you accredited, done. something's on your account, right? Ah. Right. So he's telling this guy it's his own fault. Or perhaps at least he owes that debt. Well, think 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 about this. You you brought up Dostoevsky, right? Mm hmm. I brought up Kafka. It was Kafka. Yeah. Well, you also brought up Dostoevsky in the previous mm -hmm. in our previous stream. You 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 kind of went quickly over him because well. His uh, his magnum opus is kind of kind of long and deep, but it's interesting that the reason that it exists in the first place is because he did a bunch of soul searching. He did a bunch of soul searching and basically wanted to know out no okay, I only have control over myself. So what have I done? To cause me to be in the mess that I'm in. 
because ultimately you can only ever take responsibility for yourself. I believe there's this there's a book that was written in the past few years, and I'm not sure of the title anymore. I and I haven't read it. I'll admit it, but it, it has to do. It was written by an Navy SEAL that talked about one of the biggest points was I, I saw an interview with him. That's the reason I, I bring it up. That one of the biggest points is is um, taking responsibility for your life to an absurd extent. Things that you could have had no control over, still taking responsibility for them, learning from them, and trying to figure out how to improve things for the future. So regardless of whether it is your fault or not, because you are the only one that has control over your actions, you need to take responsibility for what it is you're going to do about it. It's sort of like if somebody messes up your house and leaves, you still have to clean it. Exactly. Even if it's not your mess. Or or, or if somebody does something horrible to someone that you love and can't atone for it, well, are you going to let your loved one suffer? No. At least not if you're a decent human being, you're going to take care of your loved one. So we're all we, we, we're all stuck with the hand that we're dealt. And when, when when since we talked about victimhood a little bit before, we can talk about victimhood now too. Certainly we can go and say, okay, I am a victim, you are a victim. Every single one of us watching this stream is a victim of something. None of us has a perfect life. I'm certain we will all agree on that. But, okay, some of us can maybe be more victimized than others, okay? But who decides? Who decides, really? By, by what standard do we decide that person X is more victimized than another? Is it wealth? Okay. So the person born with the silver spoon in his or her mouth is going to be less of a victim than somebody born into abject poverty. I don't think so. Because we all, as humans, have the same capacity for gratitude, for thinking on the right sorts of things, and for determining our attitude, as well as for being an embittered, miserable, suicidal person. Like People from all walks of life have, have, have the entire range of human experience, enough to have a full life. And ultimately, the only thing that we that we really have that we can that we can take full ownership of no matter what station in life we have is according to Viktor Frankl the attitude that we bring to whatever situation we happen to have and have about the situation we're in okay so so we can be a victim we can have uh, i if 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 uh I'm dealt, I don't know, let, 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 let's say a, a jack and a ten and you're dealt a two and a three. What are you going to do? If I'm dealt a two and a three and you're dealt a, a jack and a ten, what are we going to do? We can't do anything except for play the hand that we're dealt. We can't do anything except for play the hand that we're dealt. And so throwing a pity party for ourselves isn't going to do anybody any good. But the fact is, Especially since we all kind of have bought into the game. We all have skin in the game. We're all alive. We might as well play the hand that we're dealt the best that we can. And the fact of the matter is it's not a zero-sum game either. Life is not a zero-sum game. We can still make the most of the hand that we have. Because even if I have a two, e even if I have some twos or whatever, I'm infinitely better off than the person that folds the cards. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget that you're infinitely better off than the person that folds. Or the person that just says, I'm just going to sit here and whine and not, play, not pay attention, not do the right thing. No, no, you can't do that. You just can't do that. I mean, certainly you can, but it's not going to be good for you, and it's not going to be good for anybody else. So, all evil do I accredit to thee. All the world's problems are my problems, from my perspective. 
from your perspective. All the world's problems are your problems. They're getting in the way of you doing and receiving what it is that you want. Now, what are you going to do about it? The virtue of the pillar shalt thou strive after. More beautiful, more graceful, but internally harder and more sustaining the higher it riseth. Yea, thou sublime one, one day shalt thou also be beautiful and hold up the mirror to thine own beauty. Internally harder and more sustaining the higher it riseth. So the more this guy as soon as he makes that first decision to pull the plow and start tilling, and, you know, his lowing sort of exalts the earth as this uh, ox metaphor. As soon as he makes that decision, as soon as he cuts ground, he's going to be a little bit stronger. It will never be easy, but partially that's because he tills more deeply the stronger he gets. Internally harder and more sustaining, the higher it riseth. Then will thy soul thrill with divine desires, and there will be adoration even in thy vanity. For this is the secret of the soul. When the hero hath abandoned it, then only approach, approacheth it in dreams the superhero. Thus spoke Zarathustra. So when a man abandons himself is when he becomes the superman. Adoration even in your vanity, because you've taken in so much of the world around you that that which you admire in yourself is something you're admiring in the outside world, and vice versa. And really, the stuff he's describing, then will thy soul thrill with divine desires, and there will be adoration even in thy vanity. This is all stuff the sublime one wants. It's exactly what he wants. This uh, the, the penitent in spirit, the sublime one, is the sort of person who's looking for that exactly. And when he finally affects this transformation, that's when he actually gets it. Kind of some interesting give and take. Don't you agree? Because somebody desired it for its own sake. Because the sublime one. Yeah, the guy says no sound at 7.32. PM. Oh, that's probably because I had my mic muted. Oh, okay. Oh, dear. Well. That's why we're down to two people. Yeah, well, it was ending that, anyway. It was ending yes. anyway. It was like just during my last, during my last thing that I said. But but would you care to? Because somebody wanted it for its own sake. You wanted me to continue, right? Yeah. Because somebody wanted virtue for its own sake. It goes back to this ancient idea that virtue for its own sake is a good thing. Why is that, Caleb? 
because something has to be good for its own sake. It's everything is only good for the sake of something else. You never actually get to anything that's actually good. I want A for the sake of B. Why do you want B for the sake of C? Why do you want C for the sake of D, E, F, G? A1, A2, AB, A3, Z3, you know, it, it just goes on forever. So you, something has to... so you have to act in the way that you're aiming for the right thing. At least that you're aiming for the right thing. If you are not aiming for the right thing, you have no hope. But if you're aiming for the right thing, then at least you have some hope that something that you throw in that general direction will hit the mark. And that's all, that's all the guarantee any of us ever have. But still, the more missiles you throw at that point, the more you, you, you do, the, the, the more likely you are to get what you want. Virtue over time is the best course of action. Now, certainly, sometimes a white lie might get you out of a out of a scrape but if you make a habit of lying well you're making you're making you're making the world miserable for yourself and for everybody else right you know uh, 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 as a married man i could say for instance a roll in the hay with somebody that's not my wife might i don't know i get my rocks off once right that that could be viewed as a good thing or as what whatever but Doing that would not be conducive to me having a happy life. There, there, there are, the, you know, there are things that are good in and of themselves. Things that have actually stood the test of time. There are things that need to be conserved, and those things that that we can all pretty much agree on, unless we're completely demented, are virtues. Those are virtues that we agree on. Now, certainly, in our own system of values, we might wind up having other things that we consider virtues, that others might consider vices. But still, we, based on our own set of priorities, must live our lives in accordance with the system of virtues that we believe. And if we believe nothing is virtuous, well, then we're stuck back in chapter 28 with nothing worth living for. Yes, exactly. So find something that you want <clears throat> that will pull you out of it. And, and Nietzsche's response to this sort of person, I think, is very apt. Because on the one hand, you want to go, there, there, I know it's hard for you. You don't want to go do that because the guy's throwing a pity party already. On the other hand, you don't want to just walk by and smack him upside the head because he's also had enough of that already. Nietzsche's response is the best one, which is to dang find something the guy wants dangle it in front of his face and say, hey, you want this? You want this? You want this? Smells good, doesn't it? And that's what works in that situation. So do you have anything else to say, Matt? Any closing remarks? None. I think that we've hit I think we've hit the subject pretty well. All right. Well, thank you everyone who showed up. That's all we have for now. Until next time.